So Casey gave a brief introduction uh, to what we're talking about today. The consensus from the policymakers is that we are not going to try to pronounce M-A-U-C-R-S-A. -S -S That's just silly. We're going to simply refer to it as the act. And so from here on out, I will simply say the act. And we're not going to try to pronounce M-A-U-C-R-S-A. -S um, Casey gave an abridged history of the bill, uh, but I, I want to add a little bit more complexity to that and remind everybody that, in fact, Remember first we had the MMRSA? Remember when MRSA was a bummer? And so first it was the MMRSA, then it was the MCRSA, then it was the AUMA, now it's the MAUCRSA. So we have actually gone through, this is our fourth iteration of a full seed to sale regulatory tracking quality assurance uh, and now taxation program, really for uh, four entire overhauls in, in um, just under three years. <laughs> so, not a small feat. Um, I think one of the things that's important for folks to realize just by way of framing and at the beginning is this isn't likely to happen again. The big questions have largely been answered at this point. Like it or not, the outcomes that are in this legislation are likely to be pretty stable for at least the next couple of years. I think it will be you know, four, five, six years before we see another major legislative overhaul. And so, you know, all along the way, I've encouraged that we're gonna have to balance very carefully between what can we change and how can we make it work. So there are things that we might not like. Sometimes we advocate to change them. Sometimes we figure out strategies for making them work. We're in a time period now where we probably have a bias toward make it work. Our ability to influence legislation and laws is going to remain very high in Sacramento, but the likelihood that lawmakers are going to introduce new major overhaul laws in the next couple of years, I think, is very low. Obviously, there is still a mountain of work. In fact, writing the laws was one mountain of work. Now there's seven or eight mountains of work as each one of the agency puts their rules together. So there are a lot of more granular questions final resolution questions that are absolutely still in flux and will still be answered. But with regard to the big overarching statutory and legal questions, we really have reached the point where, you know, as I've said a few times in, in committee hearings lately, the foundation has set. We haven't built the house yet, but the foundation is set. So for folks who have built their own place or know what building is like, that's kind of where we are. We've got a solid foundation. It's square and level. Beyond that, we've got a lot of decisions still to make. So, with that said, um, I'm not going to point the microphone at the speaker because that's just painful for all of our ears. Um, we are getting around the state. Some of you remember back in 2015, we did this when the, I guess it was the MMRSA at the time. Um, that time, we got to about 6,000 folks up and down the state. Uh, you are our fourth workshop in this year's tour. We are shooting for 10,000 uh, contacts with growers this year. Um, and it's absolutely fantastic to see all of you here. Um, what I've learned in the last few times of doing this workshop is that it works best if I don't read every word that's in here. You have this and you can take it home and look at it. But if we go over some of the higher points and then really spend as much of the time as we can actually drilling into specific questions. Some of them I'll have answers for or insight into. Some of them I won't. Those are the ones we're gonna write down so when we go back to do our strategic planning, if there's an unanswered question, we figure out what the answer should be, and then we go make that happen. So, going to spend as much time with dialogue as we can, as much time trying to get to your specific questions. Do have to make a note on this document. This is a draft. Be patient with typos or whatnot. There is nothing in this that is incorrect, but it may not be completely proofread for layout and, and whatnot. And so we do still have some time for you to get your questions back into us. If there's anything this doesn't cover that you'd like to see covered or anything that you'd like more detail on, uh, email that policy at CA Growers uh, email address on the front there and we will get you an answer in short order. We will be updating this uh, after the legislative session ends in September. In case there are any last minor tweaks to it, we're going to wait until after the whole thing's done in September to get you a final working guide. So you just keep this in, in, in mind that it is a draft. With all of that said, are there any opening questions that we should get out of the way up front? Awesome. That was super streamlined and, and not that challenging. Um, 
All right, so how many people have been paying a bit of attention to what's going on in policy? All right, cool. So I'm not going to start uh, too far from scratch, other than to say that the, the act, this new combined MAU-CRSA, uh, includes the same three regulatory agencies, uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, the Department of Public Health, and the Department of Food and Agriculture. Uh, they are going to issue generally the same licenses as were in the MCRSA. A few differences on licenses here. The transport license does not exist anymore in the new framework. Uh, we'll talk about this a bit later on. Unfortunately, some of you will remember back in 2015 when only distributors could move product from farm to processing center. Unfortunately, we find ourselves in that position again um, where we're not allowed to drive product down the hill without a licensed third party. We'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. So transport license is gone. There's the addition of the micro business license. And on the five year horizon, there is the addition of the type five unlimited scale license. In addition to those licenses, the type P processing and because government makes so much sense. The second type P packaging license, yes, that is right, we have two type P licenses because it wasn't confusing enough. Um, those licenses both exist and there is a type N infusion license. So we've got our type one through three cultivation, type four nursery, type six uh, non-volatile solvent, type seven volatile solvent, type eight testing, type 10 retail, type 11 distribution, type 12 micro business, and then we have the two type P's, the type N, and uh, that's all. So there's 20 licenses to be issued by three different agencies, and there are three more licenses that will be issued down the road. Um, the concept of 19328, uh, Business and Professions Code 19328, that outlined which licenses you could hold at the same time, is gone. There are no restrictions on cross licenses. You can hold any license you want in any combination with the exception of the testing lab. And so, you know, this, this concept of segmented marketplace, growers and retailers being separate except for with that small crossover of the Type 10A is no longer statutes. Um, we do not expect to see those types of restrictions in the final regs. Couple other key changes here. Um, obviously, the law pertains to both adult use and medical. Uh, medicinal, we changed it to medicinal just to make things fun. It's no longer medical cannabis, it's now medicinal cannabis in the eyes of the law. FYI, not sure it matters. But, um, but you won't apply for a type one license and then get to sell both adult use and medical. There will be type one A and type one M. And so all of the licenses we just talked about, there's 20 of them, there's actually gonna be two different sets of licenses, the A set and the M set. If you are a type one medical grower, the theory is you may only sell to type M manufacturers or type M distributors or type M retailers, vice versa on the other side. Now, when we were negotiating this, we made it very clear that A and M licenses need to be able to co-locate, meaning if you have a 5,000 square foot orchard, you should get to have that 5,000 square foot be grown as either adult or medical or both. That was the agreement that we made with the governor's administration. The law, however, when it was drafted, was uh, internally inconsistent with one section seeming to indicate that that was the case and another section then contradicting itself. Um, we are still working with them to clean this up. I can tell you right now that I'm not an attorney and this isn't legal advice, but currently the law says you're either A or M. I will give you a high degree of confidence that by January 1st, 2018, you will be able to be A and M. However, you will have to pull two separate licenses in order to achieve that. Um, concept of premises. You guys love the term premises yet? And anybody just thrilled with premises? So <clears throat> the premises is one of the factors that is going to matter very much when it comes to licensure. There's, a, there's really three different, uh, three different categories of process that the state is going to go through. They're going to process the applicant. That is the person who puts their name on the application. There are a set of responsibilities and requirements the applicant must meet. Then they are going to process the owners. That's anyone who holds a stake in the company, or in some cases it's management staff. High level staff can be considered owners. 
for the purposes of the law. And then the third thing they're going to process is the site, the premises. Now, each license will be tied to a unique premises. What that means is that it has a unique entrance and a movable barrier separating it from a, another premise. Each premise will need to have its own license. You can't have a, you know, a multi-use facility covered by one license. You will need a separate license for each activity. Um, it doesn't mean separate building. It doesn't mean separate parcel, separate APN number. It simply means that it has its own entrance. So for the purposes of an outdoor grow, if you have a perimeter fence around your orchard and you have a gate, that is a separate entrance. If you have two orchards next to each other and each one has a gate, those technically would qualify as separate entrance for each one. Um, I will just note real quickly, one of the other things that we are working on in this regard is ensuring that commonly shared facilities like parking spaces, break rooms, um, reception areas, that those types of things can be shared between premises. Real quick, the no cars are going around for writing down questions. Oh, cool. Those are going to be really helpful later, so awesome. um, we'll collect them back later. Feel free, obviously, feel free to ask questions during the presentation, but the more questions that we gather up, the more effectively we can answer. And I shouldn't sit on the sound equipment. That's my best guess. Um, and so uh, we are working on easing the restrictions on premises. Um, important to realize that for cultivation, uh, multi-tenant cultivation is explicitly allowed. There is a tough area with the type N infusion license. There are a lot of product makers, food makers, topicals, product makers that are at such a small scale, they only need a commercial kitchen maybe one day a week in order to meet their volume. And so we also have amendments that we've proposed um, that would allow for up to four product makers to share the same kitchen or production facility provided they weren't using it at the same time. So I know I said the foundation is set and all the major questions are answered, there are about three outstanding pieces, two of which I've just detailed for you, one of which we'll talk about a little bit later that we think might still be changed before we get this thing off the runway. Um, pretty significant shift with regard to the relationship between the state government and the local government with regard to local licenses and permits. Under the MM and the MCRSAs, uh, the, the threshold of requirement was that you have a local license permit or other authorization in hand prior to applying for a state license. The current threshold and the, the threshold that we expect to remain the law for some time is that you may not be operating in violation of a local ordinance. The state government is not allowed to ask you for your local permit. However, you are allowed to supply one to demonstrate that you are in compliance. If you, the applicant, does not supply a local permit, they will call your local government and say, hey, Mr. Smith has applied for ABC activities on XYZ parcel. Are they in violation? The county has 60 days to respond, and if the answer is anything other than yes, the application will move forward for processing. So if it's, well, you know, they're not really blah, blah, blah. If there's any explaining that goes into it, the state's going to continue forward processing. If the answer is yes, they're in violation, they will put it in the reject stack and not move forward from there. If the county does not respond in 60 days, they will assume that you are not in violation and move your application over to the keep processing stack. Bit more wiggle room here, strongly discourage building business models on this. The county can at any time change their local ordinance or local regulations, and as the nature of this is, if they change it and the loophole is closed, you don't have any uh, cause of action, essentially. You, you are just up a creek without a paddle at that point. So it might help with some of the timing issues if the permits aren't quite issued in time, etc. but I don't think and wouldn't encourage it as a long-term strategy. It is, you know, a significant shift in the thresholds though. Um, that's really all that I want to say about licenses and agencies at this point.